welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe, the place in our universe where faith and ideas collide, faith and reason meet. I'm Doug Keck, your host, coming to you from our studios here, the mothership of EWTN right in the heart of Irondale, Alabama, Mother Angelica Way, where it all began and continues to this day. Today's topic is the examine prayer. What is it and why is it important, especially to the Jesuits? You can email us questions at spitzersuniversityewtn.com. You can post your questions on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash EWTN online hashtag FS universe and send us a tweet at twitter.com forward slash EWTN hashtag FS universe as well. And hopefully we'll be doing some of these live on Facebook in the future. We're looking into that as well so people can check that out. And the Magis Center for All Things Father Spitzer, again, a wonderful website, Magis Center. Dot com where it all comes together. And don't forget that Father Spitzer will be one of the many superb guest speakers at the Los Angeles Congress coming up this weekend. And uh, EW10 will be out there doing radio and TV. Uh, Brian Patrick, our own Brian Patrick, will be out there doing some interviews. Hopefully you'll get the chance to sit down with Father Spitzer. Look for a special EWTN on location from there in the future, focusing on radio and also on the events from the LA Congress. Now we take you out to Father Spitzer at our West Coast Studios, Christ Cathedral, a beautiful campus out there in Orange County, California, where Father Spitzer is ensconced in our beautiful studio <laughs> with the beautiful campus pictured behind him. Great to see you again, Father. <laughs> it's great to see you too, Doug, and uh, ensconced I am. There you go. <laughs> so let's let's talk about, the, we're going to be talking about the exam and prayer, but before we get to there, let's, yeah. let's, let's hit a couple of questions from last week's show, some holdovers, and then before we get into this week's questions, you can talk a little bit about what the exam and prayer is. So let's go first. Sure. Uh, last week, Father Spitzer, someone asked about fasting and prayer. I personally believe that many of the saints pray in this way in order to be able to have a much more powerful impact when praying. They offer themselves mm -hmm. more purely to God and in turn is able to do more of his great work through them. And this is from Beverly. So I guess she's going back to the idea of mm -hmm. her own perspective on why she thinks fasting is important. Yeah, I agree totally with her, and I think fasting is a, a very good thing. I think it uh, really, you know, again, part of prayer is to keep ourselves, you know, uh, fixed on the Lord, and, um, and fasting does that, um, and uh, I, I think it really helps us to kind of detach from the things of the world and gives us that sense of, uh, of separateness, and, um, and that absolutely helps contemplative life. And um, uh, I, uh, you know, much as I should do m much more fasting than I do do, mm -hmm. uh, I think it is a, a very, very, very good habit, and I think it does uh, perform that uh, detachment. Saint Ignatius Loyola uh, recommended it, mm -hmm. and of course, within reason, uh, the the last thing we want to do is get ourselves, you know, so um, uh, wrapped up in, in a penance mm -hmm. um, that we can't concentrate anymore. On, on something positive. So in other words, you, you have to, uh, penances within limits uh, is what St. Ignatius Loyola would say. You, you, you know, if you've got a hair shirt on mm -hmm. and it's so distracting to you that you can't pray, mm -hmm. uh, that's not good. Okay. Uh, if you're, you know, inflicting, you know, pain on yourself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in order to be detached, but, you know, the pain is so painful that you can't even concentrate on prayer and you're, you're kind of dying of discouragement, uh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. So he always just said, use discernment. And uh, in two weeks from now, we will be talking about following the Holy Spirit and the rules for the discernment of spirits, uh, kind of a brief course in that. And so we can talk about just, well, how would you use those rules for discernment uh, to determine, well, how much fasting is good and, and when does it you know, get in the way of prayer, get in the way of faith, and lead to a decrease in trust and hope and love? Right. Very good. My problem is uh, the fast part I got down. It's how quickly I eat or the kinds of food like fast food that I eat. <laughs> now, unfortunately, it's the ING part that I'm, I'm struggling with here. But uh, you'll, you're inspiring me with your answers. Here's another question. Last week, you touched a bit on fasting and prayer. Will my fasting help yeah. my daughter who is addicted to drugs and alcohol? I do pray for her daily. We no longer have contact with her. And this is Sharon, obviously a very sad story. What about that? I mean, obviously she, she needs to keep praying. Will the fasting help that as well? Mm -hmm. I think uh, all prayer 
um, and all fasting, which is kind of a, you know, um, not only a form of detachment so we can pray, but it's also a form of, of binding ourselves to God, you know, treating him as, uh, you know, the, the first priority in our lives. I think all fasting and prayer is helpful. Uh, you never, ever want to discount it. I mean, obviously, there, you know, are two big mitigating uh, circumstances, you know, uh, to when God is, is going to alleviate uh, suffering. The first thing is God is not going to violate, uh, Sharon, your daughter's freedom. It's just he, he is going to allow her to be free. And of course, you, you say to yourself, well, wait, an, an addict is not a free person. And that is a very true statement. Oh. An addict is not just free to stop. Um, but what we can pray for is that, um, you know, somehow when she reaches rock bottom in her addiction, that that moment, right, that Bill Wilson talks about, this is a fellow who started Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Bill Wilson talks about, you know, everyone, uh, drug addicts, alcoholics, right, sex addicts, all of these addictions, when people reach a kind of rock bottom, uh, they do have this almost you know, very glaring moment of clarity where they know, you know, this is it for me. Uh, either I make a choice to get out of this, which means seeking help because I can't do it by myself, or I'm going to die, or I'm going to, you know, end up in a, in a, you know, a terrible situation. And, and of course, normally, you know, it, it, right there, there's this great moment in this clarity of freedom mm -hmm. where a person can reach out for help, uh, you know, maybe a 12-step program, and there are many of them, mm -hmm. or reach out just to go to a detox with a 12-step program, or reach out to get one of these, uh, you know, pellets that they can put in you to, to detoxify you, uh, you know, over a 12-month period, and they're, they're incredibly successful, oh, wow. uh, you know, and, and so forth. Yeah, there's, there's really some excellent therapies, but um, the, the main thing is they're going to have to reach out for help. Now, I think, you know, you know, if she's cut off contact with you, you know, the, the main thing is keep praying that when she does reach that rock bottom level, and, and, and she probably will, that she's going to have that moment of clarity and she's going to reach out for that help and she's going to turn her life around. And you can turn your life around. But the second thing that, that is kind of uh, ongoing, um, you know, um, with her is, is um, you know, um, uh, you got to remember that God in his mercy, right, you know, her going to heaven, um, you know, you might say, well, gosh, she's so gano, you know, does she have a chance of salvation? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, she does have a chance, uh, you know, for salvation. And, and it, you know, in a way, she in her addiction is so unfree. Mm -hmm. She is so incapable of what's called full consent of the will, which is one of the conditions necessary for a mortal sin, that yes, of course, God in his mercy can absolutely save her. Mm -hmm. So even if she, you know, if the worst should happen and she kind of goes on a, a horrible drift or even, you know, something worse, God can still save her and wants to still save her. She's still his daughter as she's your daughter. She, she, she's still a beloved as she is beloved to you. You know, even a billion times told lovelier. God is still going to try and bring her to the fullness of himself in her freedom. And we don't know how he's going to do that, mm -hmm. but it, maybe it just can't happen during this, this earthly life. Somehow the, the cloud of the addiction, uh, you know, will have to be left to God's mercy in the next life. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, Jesus does make provision for that in the scripture. I mean, in an ironic way, you know, when he's talking about the sin of the Holy Spirit, he says, well, this one sin uh, will not be forgiven in this life or the next. Right. You know, and you look at that and you go, well, is it possible to have forgiveness, you know, in the next life? Yes. I mean, you just use an implicative syllogism. If Jesus says there's one's not going to be forgiven in the next life, as if it's an exception, then maybe there is absolutely room. Not maybe, right. there is room 
uh, for forgiveness in the next life. And maybe the cloud, the fog of addiction wow. may not per permit her to do it in this life. But you have to keep uh, uh, hoping and you have to keep hoping in his unconditional love because you know he wants to save her and if it's within the bounds of her freedom that she wants to be saved when she's clear and out of the fog god is going right. to do everything he can to save her uh, that that's who he is he's the father mm -hmm. of the prodigal son implicative syllogisms eh okay and that's not uh, even yeah. Latin. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, that's an if-then syllogism. <laughs> there he goes, okay. That one went right over my head there. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let me ask you one question with that before we get to our, our next question. It's, it's related sure. to it as well. One of them is the idea, why does it seem to be that we need to so many times, or at least for some people, they have to hit rock bottom to have that moment of clarity, when it seems that others either don't or have been given the grace to see mm -hmm. the truth without having to hit rock bottom. Why is that the case? Yeah, well, you know, it's human beings are really complicated. And there's two things which really differentiate us, uh, one individual from another. And the first is our family backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just so many things that are going on in our family backgrounds that really shape, you know, kind of our ability to make good judgments, free judgments uh, in our adult lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just is. And, and the second thing is, is all of us are really different uh, psychically and psychologically as we're kind of growing. I mean, even the, the order in which you grow up, you know, let's say you're a second child or a third mm -hmm. child, that can have an effect. Or, you know, having an athletic proclivity versus not having an athletic proclivity and the father wants an athlete mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, and that could have an influence. Or being, you know, having the best grades in the class or the not so best grades in the class and having the mother or the father want the best grades right. in the class right. or whatever you know the thing is 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 you know can you know do, do, does the child feel right. you know that they can live up to the expectation so forth and so on right. uh, do they have a sense of hopefulness about their life right. hopefulness about getting uh, to their expectation now you say well why bring up all this psychology it mm -hmm. matters mm -hmm. it matters in terms of the clarity of judgment that people have later in life mm -hmm. and some people uh, you know through no fault of their own wind up just kind of getting you know they they maybe they have a really violently alcoholic parent right. or they have a parent who's just never satisfied with anything they really can do mm -hmm. you know all these things you know kind of weigh on them and and it does tend to cloud the judgment and then of course uh, the way they deal with it you know mm -hmm. I mean it, it is so important the friends they have are so important you know I mean I was lucked out on my friends in high school mm -hmm. you know I mean I could have had uh, other friends right, I can I tell know, you I understand, and right. uh, <laughs> oh yeah and so it's uh, so it's it's one of those things where you know that we are so different from each other individually mm -hmm. it's so hard to to figure out however you know sometimes you can get a profile right. and you can really see when somebody's going to go seriously awry. I mean, no one is born a sociopath. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's, you know, you, you might have a tendency right. because there's schizophrenia in the family, but normally these things happen over the course of time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, essentially, you know, we're just so different from each other, but you're right. Some right. people just have lucid right. judgment right away and they go, I'm not going to take drugs. Right. Right. I've got too much to live for. Right. And another guy will say, this looks really interesting. Right. What have I got to lose? Right, exactly. And you go, what was right. the, the siblings from the same family? Or I can master you know, it. It, just, it won't master me. I can, I can master, master it. Master it. Right. That's, oh, yes. Right. There's the another continuous one. continuous belief. We got, we got a couple of minutes to our, to our first, first break, and I want yeah, to get sure. this one question, and then we can come back and start sure. talking about the exam and prayer. Sure. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, I have been in a nursing home for years with MS and other problems. I'm not sure what redemptive suffering means. We talk about that a lot, of course. But I should unite my mm -hmm. suffering to Christ. Does this mean I should not take pain medicine? Jesus suffered terribly. He did not have pain medicine. 
please explain. This is Gail from Wisconsin. So I think we'd be pretty clear that no one's asking you not to take pain medication, right? All right. Uh, Gail, just two quick things. Um, first of all, please take your pain medication. And believe me, that's God's will. And, uh, you know, how might we know, you know, what's going on here? I mean, first of all, remember that Jesus asks the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane to take this cup, which means the cup of suffering. That's what he means by that phrase. Take this cup of suffering away from me. But if it is not your will that it be taken from me, then okay, I will accept your will. Your will be done. Not my will, but yours be done. So the, the idea is, first of all, can we take things to alleviate our suffering? Yes. Can we pray that God will prevent our suffering? Yes. Can we pray that God will take away um, inevitable suffering or real suffering? Yes. God doesn't want you to undergo pain. Mm -hmm. and, and just remember this right now. God is not in a stoic contest. Remember what a stoic philosopher is, right? A stoic philosopher, you know, it says that, that there's a good in pain, but the good of pain is not love. The good of pain is not unifying your suffering to Christ. The good of pain is so that you can rise from mediocrity. Mm -hmm. You can prove that, you you know, what does not kill you makes you stronger, right? right? Uh, you know, the, the, the kind of the Nietzschean, Nietzschean kind of right, contest. Right, you right, can, right. yeah, that's right. And so God mm -hmm. is, believe me, not Friedrich Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. and, and believe Thank me, uh, God is, <laughs> is not Marcus Aurelius. Mm -hmm. and, and so forth. You know, the main thing, so the idea of harder, better, faster, mm -hmm. that is not God's objective. Mm -hmm. God wants what will cultivate love in you. God wants what's going to cultivate salvation for you and what will help you help others toward their salvation. That's what God wants. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want harder. He doesn't want faster. He doesn't want better unless those things will help you to your salvation, help you to become purified in love, and help you to help others in salvation. Mm -hmm. By you taking on enormous pain mm -hmm. that is, you know, that could lead to discouragement. Of right. course it can lead to discouragement. We have thousands of studies which show that pain can discourage people. God has nothing to gain from your becoming discouraged. Because if you become discouraged, you are likely to become dark and despairing. And if you become despairing, which is the opposite of hope, that can't be God's right. will. That is another spirit's will namely the evil spirit. Right. For all intents and purposes, God wishes no pain on you, no discouragement on you that, you know, is going to discourage you. That's right. Even though, you know, that pain can be transformed into some good for the church, right. God has your intention first and foremost in mind. Right. And you know, He's always saying to you, right. I want you saved. Right. I want you to go to heaven and I want you to help others right. to go to heaven. I want you to be filled with hope, not with the discouragement right. of an overbearing pain. Right, and you also don't Excuse want that, me, because if you're in that situation, you might decide to make some bad decisions in the midst of being in despair and in pain. So we're gonna take a break right now. Absolutely. Uh, much more ahead with Father Spitzer. We're gonna be talking about the examine prayer. What is it and why it's important? Stay with us right here in Father Spitzer's universe. We'll be back. midst of Father Spitz's universe. Welcome back. I'm Doug Keck here. We're talking about the examine prayer just about with Father Spitzer. 
And Father, we rejoin you. Let's talk about the topic, the examine prayer. And I mentioned earlier, connection to the Jesuits. Why don't mm -hmm. you talk about what it is and why it's important to Jesuit spirituality and why it also seems to be incredibly popular these days. Yeah, well, um, the examine prayer is different from an examination of conscience that you would have, for example, before confession. So normally before your confession, you're, you're kind of reflecting on what went wrong, and you're, you're, you're essentially asking the Lord for forgiveness and for healing uh, so that you can do better next time through the grace that you get in absolution. So that that's a perfectly important and valid thing to do is do an examination of conscience for your reconciliation and a, a good examination of conscience is very good for our spiritual lives. But the exam and prayer is different. It's not so much focused on, on what you're doing wrong or what went wrong uh, during a month or a couple of months. What you're focusing on instead is becoming the ideal. In other words, you're, you're trying to, you know, enter into the heart of the Lord and to be transformed in the heart of the Lord. And as you said, St. Ignatius Loyola was, this prayer for him was very important. Not so much to kind of move away from sin. He had what's called a particular exam, which did that. But the general exam, this was to kind of move toward transformation in the heart of the Lord. It was to get to the ideal of Christ, the ideal of the imitation of Christ. And we can kind of split that prayer into, into three parts. And of course, it's a part of Jesuit spirituality. Mm -hmm. And the first part, I'm just going to call it the prayer of gratitude uh, for a moment, because mm -hmm. uh, that's a big part of the exam and prayer. A second part of the exam and prayer is, is almost preparatory. You, you kind of have to do this before or you do the exam every day, and, and it sometimes presumes the spiritual exercises, but what it is, is contemplation on the heart of Christ. Mm -hmm. And what St. Ignatius had Jesuits do is essentially do these contemplations where you're entering into the biblical scene and, and actually being a recipient of the love of Christ. So you're Zacchaeus, the sinner, and, and Jesus calls to you, you know, with that, almost that smile in his eyes, come down here, you know, and, and uh, I'm coming to your house for supper. Or you're Matthew, the tax collector, and he, I'm calling you mm -hmm. as my disciple. I don't care if you're a tax collector or not. Or you are Peter, the fisherman. You know, nobody ever paid attention to you. And Jesus is going to, boom, you know, I'm calling you to be a fisher of men. Mm -hmm. And so forth. So you're experiencing the love of God in the call to discipleship or in the call to follow him. Right. Discipleship means to, to be a follower. Right. So to, to follow him more nearly. So the idea then uh, in, in the second part is to know who Christ is. Mm -hmm. and, and the third part is to ask for the ideal, to ask to be like Christ. And I do this through the Beatitudes, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, um, uh, you know, to, you know, for example, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. That means blessed are the humble hearted, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I just say, Lord, help me to be humble hearted with you humble hearted. So I'm asking for the ideal in love. You know, Jesus says, blessed are the meek. And that generally means blessed are the gentle hearted, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I just ask the Lord, you know, Lord, help me to be gentle hearted with you who are gentle hearted, you know, or, or, uh, you know, uh, the same thing with, you know, zealous for souls, you know, blessed are those who, you know, hunger and thirst for righteousness, you know, Lord, help me to hunger and thirst for righteousness with you who are righteousness itself. You know, Lord, help me to be merciful with you who are merciful. And, and of course, that means forgiving and, and compassion. So help me to be forgiving and compassionate with you who are forgiving and compassionate. So the idea with the exam in prayer is not so much the flight from sin, which is an important thing. Nipping sin in the bud is a very important thing. But, um, you know, the examination of conscience part, it really is the movement mm. uh, toward the ideal and uh, the movement into the imitation of Christ, into the heart of Christ, corad cor loquitur, heart speaking to heart. Mm -hmm. So the idea for Ignatius is, well, what are the three things that can really do that for you? Number one, you have to be grateful. 
Mm -hmm. Number two, you have to know the heart of Christ. And number three, you have to ask the Lord to have that heart. His heart, you've got to ask, right? The Lord loves people who ask in prayer to ask for those graces of humble heartedness, mm -hmm. gentle heartedness, zeal for soul, righteousness, forgiveness, compassion, peacemaking, and, and purity of heart. Ask him for those graces in the beatitude. Mm -hmm. and, and those are the ways, says Ignatius, that we kind of can orient ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can, you know, move toward him more and more. So uh, it's, it's the path to the ideal. And, and let me just pause on gratitude, that mm -hmm. first step for a moment. Right. Because people might think, well, why is that so important? You know, I mean, uh, that we be grateful. Why does Ignatius emphasize it so much? The very last exercise in the spiritual exercises is called the contemplation to attain divine love. Well, what's the way to attain divine love? It is to be thankful. Mm -hmm. It's to be grateful. It's that whole idea. You know, I never knew a person who was grateful and was unhappy. Mm -hmm. I never knew a person who was ungrateful and happy. That right. great adage, mm -hmm. right? You know, and the, the idea is gratitude liberates the soul. If I'm, gr you know, if a person is grateful for their spouse, then they're going to be happy with their spouse. They know they're going to be blessed by their spouse. They're not going to take their spouse for granted. Mm -hmm. They're not going to take the good things of their spouse for granted. The more grateful we are, right, if we're grateful for our work, even though, of course, we can think of things in our work situation that we would uh, want improved. Uh, you know, there are things, of course, we can think about in our lives mm -hmm. that we want improved. But uh, St. Ignatius says the first thing is be grateful for what you have. Mm -hmm. Do not make resentment and ingratitude be the whole you know, screen through which you look at life. I don't have this, I don't have that. All you can do is look at life in is resentment, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, eventually you're gonna look at God uh, resentfully for giving well, you this bad life. Right. And by the way, you can be a millionaire in the best health in the world, be the smartest person right. in the world, the greatest athlete in the world all at once, and be miserably miserable. Uh, miserable because of ingratitude and think, well, this guy's got slightly more than me and that other guy has slightly more than me. I got dealt a bad hand. Mm -hmm. I'm in misery even in my 1,000 uh, IQ and my great athletic talent, etc. Right. Now, the main thing for, for Ignatius is it's not just the, the happiness that comes from, you know, being grateful. It's not just, you know, our human relationships that are vastly approved when we are grateful, but it's our relationship with God that's vastly improved. Because when we know that we have been blessed, right? Life's not perfect, mm -hmm. but when we know that we have been blessed in our lives, maybe by our oh. past family, or maybe by a sister or brother we have, or maybe by some friends that we have, or maybe maybe by the church that we have, or maybe by the pastor that we have. But if we take time to be grateful for our family, for the past that we've had, for the church that we have, for the salvation that we've been given, mm -hmm. for the creation around us, for the good things that happen to us in this day, if we take time to be grateful, we will know that we have been blessed. Mm -hmm. And instead of secretly resenting God, we are basically blessing well, the Lord and let me, know, let because me, we know that we've been blessed. Let me ask blessed. you about that. We know we've been loved. But because mm -hmm. you, you talk mm -hmm. about the grace. It strikes me to, today uh, that we're dealing with a culture where the idea of gratitude or thankfulness is a, a very much of an alien concept. Do you think it's less you know? likely for people to feel that way? Do, or, do people feel owed? Do they feel like they're not grateful because mm -hmm. they think they're more in control or should be in control? I mean, you hear more people blaming God for, how, like you said, I didn't ask to be born than thanking mm -hmm. God for the opportunity yeah. that I got to be born. Well, you know, an attitude of entitlement is inversely proportional uh, to gratitude. I mean, and it's inversely proportional, therefore, uh, to the happiness and the good relationships that come uh, from gratitude. And it's therefore inversely uh, proportional uh, to prayer and, and to the, the sense of, of really being blessed and loved by God. So, yes, I think an attitude of entitlement 
is horrible. Mm -hmm. I think it's psychologically horrible. I think it's interpersonally horrible, theologically horrible. It's a bad starting mm -hmm. point. And if people really have that, you know, my one thought is you got to get over it mm -hmm. because it's simply not true. Mm -hmm. Look at the world around you and look at the poverty, and look at the challenge, look at the refugees, look at the suffering, look at what's going around you. I mean, my gosh, just to live in the United States, yeah. right? Just to live in a place that takes education seriously and where I can get that education, just to have the liberty to follow my church and to follow mm -hmm. my religious, you know, proclivities, you know, as mm -hmm. I would seek to do them and seek to do them. All these things are things to be uh, grateful for uh, without any doubt. And of course, you know, for us simply to categorically uh, ignore all of that and only look at what we don't have in this almost little Lord Fauntleroy, mm -hmm. this, you know, Cinder, this, uh, this princess. Boy, you pulled that you know, one out there, uh, the little Lord Fauntleroy. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, going yeah. back a bit there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> going back a bit. Oh, that, well, that was my parents, you know. Oh, little Lord Fauntleroy. Fauntleroy, right. right. You, you are the entitled one. <laughs> right. So, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> anyway, the, the law. Freddie Bartholomew is, was the it, famous we, one in the movies <laughs> in the 30s. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. But of course, yeah, we've made entitlement a virtue uh, <laughs> instead of making entitlement <laughs> one of the vices of all time, you know, because it's pure delusion. Mm. Entitlement is, is delusion. Mm. Uh, you know, you think you deserve all of these things, but in point of fact, I mean, the, the world is, is an imperfect place. We need one another. We're called to help one another to, to get just to the, the, the basic needs of their life, to support people in their lives, to go out and preach the faith, to make Christ known. You know, we're not out here to be served. We're, as Jesus says, we're out here to serve. So we, we really have to get over, you know, the extreme vanity of entitlement. And by the way, Entitlement equals vanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look it up in the dictionary. Right. It's the same thing. Right. And of course, you know, anybody who thinks uh, I deserve all of this, I mean, it, it and is, more. you know, sheer van <laughs> right. and more, right. you know, it is sheer vanity and vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Well, that's all going to pass away. Right. We got to know the truth about ourselves. We have to know the truth about life, the truth about our purpose in life, the truth about faith, the pr truth about the service of others in faith, the truth of the service of others in charity, the truth of trying to to be a grace in the lives of others who have it worse than we do. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we got to get over it, uh, you know, and. Um, by the way, I, I get in my entitled moods, right. you know, I'm not counting myself out right, either, no, I know. but I think just using entitlement as a presupposition for judgment is, right. is just sheer vanity and, and it's going to corrupt our vision right. of everything else and surely lead to unhappiness and is surely going to lead to right. bad relationships with others and a terrible relationship with God. Right. And the whole point is it's a lie. Right. It's totally, you well, know, it's not worth celebrity it. We've got to get over it kind of focus that we've got in the media too. I remember one person one time used the line, don't you think you know, how, how famous I think I am? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Don't you know how famous oh, yeah. I think oh, I yeah. am? You oh, know, yeah. th this idea that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm very important, you should exactly. be treating me better. And is that also the reason oh, yeah. why, I mean, to be, to be grateful, and I remember one priest telling me about it, it's the key to the humility, like you said, that idea of not da putting yeah. yourself down, but accepting, in a sense, the gifts God has given you and also where you need to work on things, if you, if you don't yeah. act grateful, then it allows you to blame God or other people for the things you see as failings in yourself, right? Yeah, exactly. Look at what you made me do mm -hmm. <laughs> when you do something bad, you know. It's, it's your fault that I did something bad, you know. It's, the whole idea, you know, of, uh, 
of that kind of entitlement or vanity is is really uh, uh, hyper problematic. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, Saint Augustine had a great way, and he's so pithy. You know, mm -hmm. he says, you know, the one thing that the devil simply can't stand is gratitude. Mm -hmm. So if you want to defeat the devil at his own gate, right. just be grateful well, to God and others well, that was his for sin, what right? they have given, who they are. Right. Yeah. That was his sin, exactly. right? Pride. Right? For a long time. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for a long time, except, you know, by the time you get to book eight, he's kind of figured it out. You know? <laughs> Oops, I was wrong. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Here, we've got uh, another question we can get to quickly here as we come up on the break. This one's a little interesting here. Father, yeah. I see similarities in the purpose and role of the examined prayer with that of Eastern religions. Both rely on meditation, the pursuit of oneness with God, a focus on making the most of the present slash today, and trying to perceive God's will and revelation. What do you think? And this is Fred, so, you know. What, how do those things, oh, where are they uh, for, similar and where are they dissimilar, I guess is probably the question. Sure. Right? Yeah. Uh, Fred, I would say that there are certain similarities with Eastern religions uh, in the sense that, you know, um, examine is meditative, so are Eastern religions, but there's a lot of Christian prayers that are meditative, mm -hmm. right? The, the Christian prayer is focused on making the most out of today, that's true, uh, you know, but lots of Christian prayers are focused on making the most out of today. But I can tell you, Eastern religions do not do the following things. Mm -hmm. Number one, Eastern religions may, some Eastern religions may have a focus on gratitude, mm -hmm. but uh, the idea of the focus on, on gratitude is not uh, also the focus as well on being blessed by God. Mm -hmm. So that's a very different approach. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, is it, you know, Eastern religions are not focused on imitating Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the whole point of the exam in prayer is to want to know Christ. You know, this is the second part of the exam in prayer. You want to know the heart of Christ so profoundly by reflecting on, uh, contemplatively on the, the New Testament scriptures and, and how he's working with all these people people, right, uh, the, from the sinners to, uh, to the, his disciples, from the sick and, and the needy all the way to the, to the rich and the Pharisees, you know, what's the heart of Jesus up to? And, and of course, no Eastern religion is going to be focused on this uh, at all. And the third thing, you know, the idea of asking to be transformed in, in the heart of Christ, uh, who, of course, is not being acknowledged. No, help me to be humble-hearted with you, humble-hearted, Lord Jesus, right? Uh, that's certainly not going to become a part uh, of Eastern prayer. So yes, there, there are some similarities with Eastern uh, meditation, but Eastern meditation and, and Christian prayers have, have all those general things in common. But of course, the, the, the three major differentiating factors is that first of all, Christianity is oriented toward Jesus Christ. Because Christianity is oriented toward Jesus Christ in the prayer, it's also going to be oriented toward love, the love that Jesus defined for us in the Beatitudes. And the third thing that Christian prayer is, is going to do is that Christian prayer is going to be in dialogue with the living God, Jesus Christ, and is going to be following the Holy Spirit in order to actualize mm -hmm. the, the prayer in their lives. And, and Christianity does those things. Eastern religions don't do those things. And, and those are the important differences. Uh, the similarities, uh, I would say the similarities show, you know, that God certainly is trying to speak to people everywhere and trying to give them a sense of how to draw closer to Him. But Christian revelation has Jesus. Christian revelation has Jesus' definition of love. Christian revelation has the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and that's just not a part of Eastern prayer, which is why we should go out and evangelize. It's not because Eastern religions are, are bad. Mm -hmm. It's because they're you know incomplete. Right. Imagine what we could do <coughs> if we could bring these three gifts to the whole wide world. Right, exactly. Perfect, Lee said, perfectly timed. I'm gonna take a break. One more time here with Father Spitzer talking about the examined prayer, answering your questions. What is it and why is it important? Much ahead, still here on the show, so stay with us. So 
talking about the examine prayer with uh, Father Spitzer and more questions ahead here right on Father Spitzer's universe as we re-engage with Father Spitzer. And uh, the next question up is, Dear Father, whenever a past sufferings or regret plagues my mind, I've noticed that when I take time to thank God for what I have and meditate on the Beatitudes, like you were talking about, that my focus is not on dwelling on things I no longer have control over, there's an important phrase, the examined prayer does just mm -hmm. this. It is a wonderful tool. So this is Gina who's been apparently using it and it seems like she's hitting on some key points, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, St. Ignatius, you know, the, the idea, uh, you know, of the Jesuits having frequent confessions, you know, annual retreats and things of that nature is to put the past behind them. Once that absolution comes, right, I absolve you from all your sins, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Once that absolution comes, and that was a sincere contrition, the, the past is the past. You can keep praying to the Lord to make good come out of whatever evil might have occurred. You can, you know, and I do pray that prayer, and I think it's a very good prayer, but that's it. I let it go. Right at that point, I say, Lord, make good come out of whatever harm I might have caused. Lord, make good come out of whatever evil I might have done. But my past is in my past, and I have no longer control over it. I'm leaving it with you, namely God, right, in, in, in prayer. Once that happens, then the examine prayer focuses us on what the Lord really wants us to focus on namely the future mm -hmm. and being more like him. And gratitude is number one, because if we're grateful for our lives, grateful for what we have, grateful for our families, honestly, the love and the trust, trust in God and love of God will come because we know he's watching out over us. Mm -hmm. We know how much we've been blessed. And of course, if we're grateful for our spouses, our friends and the people around us, that again, we know how much he's blessed us. So all these things are, are very important. But of course, as you also point out, reflecting on the Beatitudes, knowing the heart of Christ and, and trying to ask for those graces of love. You know, that's, by the way, the Beatitudes are Jesus's definition of love, right? Mm -hmm. So being humble hearted, being gentle hearted, being, you know, hungering for righteousness and being zealous for souls, being forgiving, being compassionate, being a peacemaker, being pure of heart. These are Jesus' definition, uh, you, know, you know, sort of piecemeal definitions of love. And so the, the, the main thing is, is, is if we're doing that, we're right in where God wants us. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you who wants you to go right backward to feeling guilt about your past. It's the evil spirit once again, who the book of Revelations calls the accuser. Mm -hmm. And what does the accuser have to gain by making you feel guilty again and again for the sins over which you have no control and over which and for, for which you have been forgiven? Mm -hmm. What's his purpose in doing this? To keep you so quagmired in that guilt and to mm -hmm. keep you so bogged down feeling guilty that you can't even enjoy being with the Lord. You're too busy trying to run from him. Mm -hmm. You're too busy trying to hide from him, right? <coughs> You're too busy trying to hide from yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, once that happens, once he's got you in the mode of hiding from yourself, hiding from him, right? You know, uh, uh, hiding from the Lord, I should say, and, and, and running from the Lord, then the evil spirit wins because you're not going to make any progress in the spiritual life. You're not going to think about your future. You're not even going to be able to pray or contemplate because you won't enjoy saying a Hail Mary. You won't enjoy uh, saying in our Father. You're going to be completely afflicted with guilt instead of being with your friend, mm -hmm. instead of being with the Lord who loves you so much. He, it's just like that father of the prodigal son seeing his son coming home and throwing his arms around him and kissing him and, and killing the fatty calf. Nope, you can't be with him like that because you're still reliving the past guilt. Mm -hmm. The accuser of our human nature has to be put aside. How? By the blood of the Lamb. Jesus has reconciled us 
through the sacrament of reconciliation, we're reconciled. We have been forgiven absolutely. I absolutely presume, even though I don't feel like anything I do is perfectly mm -hmm. sincere, I know I'm sincere enough in my contrition that God is going to receive that. You're sincere enough in your contrition that God's going to receive that. And, and of course, confession is such a way of showing that. Who's going to confess their sins to the likes of Father Spitzer or some other priest unless they're sincere in their contrition? Who's going to do that? So already you know you've been forgiven. There's no reason to relive this again and again and again. The main thing is get out of that mode so you can do mm -hmm. two things. Number one, you want to enjoy being with the Lord. And number two, you want to be more like him. And you can't do those two things if you are just quagmired. And of course, that's, mm -hmm. you know, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks right. when we're talking about discernment of spirits and how the uh, devil comes appearing mm -hmm. like an angel of light. This is coming from St. Paul, but it's also uh, from St. Ignatius Loyola. And the idea, you know, is the devil is, hey, uh, you should be contrite for your sins. Nay, of course you should. Mm -hmm. And the more contrite you are, right? the better, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, remember, uh, you know, G.K. Chesterton's phrase, every heresy is merely an exaggeration of the truth, mm -hmm. right? So you should be more contrite. And by the way, just don't think, and here comes the clincher, don't just think you can confess this and, and be contrite and, and uh, give it over to God by Spitzer's little prayer, mm -hmm. you know, of, you know, Lord, may good come out of whatever harm I might have caused. Right. Don't think, you should feel a little bit bit more guilt for this. And I think you ought to dredge up a few of those things from 30 years ago mm -hmm. while you're at it. Mm -hmm. And you ought to wallow in that for a while, you wretch. Right. Now, if you're hearing wretch come up or you're hearing wallow in my sin, that's not God. That's not the blood of the lamb. Right. That's another voice. And Ignatius says, watch for this voice because right when the devil comes appearing as an angel of light he always has a good recommendation to start with a very pious recommendation be contrite for your sins and you say why would the devil say that because it gets to his purpose the second thing is to exaggerate a little more then right. therefore the more contrite you are the better right mm -hmm. therefore the more you dredge up all your passions so you can be contrite all over again mm -hmm. the better still and then he <coughs> he's got you right. checkmate and of course, you were a person of the second week. That's a, something I'm going to have to explain in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But basically, that means you're a person on the road to conversion. You should be thinking about enjoying your contemplative time with the Lord. Yes, there's appropriate. There are appropriate times for contrition. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, we want to be contrite before com confession. Absolutely, we want to be contrite when we've just yelled at somebody that we didn't want to yell at. Absolutely, we want to be contrite when mm -hmm. we've done something. That just kind of goes back on God. But you can't transform your prayer into pure contrition. So we just, you're absolutely right, right. about this. Is your insight is good. You have to right. uh, get out of it, get out of the accuser mode, and absolutely point well, yourself toward the future. And the examined prayer really does Helps you that. With that. Let me ask you, it strikes me that a lot yeah. of the culture today, what, what you seem to see maybe that kind of attack veiled in is the attack of hypocrisy. The idea that if you're a mm -hmm. sinner and you lived during the 60s and the 70s and you did these things that maybe now you know weren't the best things to do, where do you get off telling anybody else how they should live? Yeah, that reminds me of a story. There's a very famous uh, Lutheran philosopher by the name of Soren Kierkegaard. And uh, one day, you know, um, he, he's going to church, you know, and some guy, uh, you know, he's a very famous philosopher, you know, and, and uh, some guy says, whoa, you know, you know, there is the great Kierkegaard. And you, above all, uh, you know, of all people, you are going into church, that place with all the hypocrites? And Kierkegaard looks at him and goes, well, well, don't you think you have a place with us hypocrites? 
And of course, if you say that, if you ask that question, right? I mean, what can the guy say if he says, no, I don't have a place of the hypocrite? You're a hypocrite for not thinking you're hypocritical. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you say, yes, I do have a place of the hypocrites, then you are a hypocrite as well. So you may as well join the hypocrites at church. Right. Yes, of course, there's always hypocrisy, you know, uh, but the hypocrisy is in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, that was something we did before. And of course, we're not trying, we're not going to church to, to, to you know, kind of steal the moral high road mm -hmm. from anyone. That's not why we're going to church. We're going to church because we want to be more like the Lord. Mm -hmm. We want His grace in our lives. We want to avail ourselves of His forgiving love. We want to be present to Him in serving His kingdom and building His kingdom. And this is what's going to bring our, us joy and meaning in life. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're going to church, not to have the moral high road on anybody else. So the accusation of hypocrisy, I think when we think of that or when we're, we're kind of sucked into mm -hmm. it is, yes, I mean, uh, you know, there, there is a, a kind of a moment of hypocrisy. Yes, I was, you know, doing all these mm -hmm. <clears throat> crazy things in a past life. Where do I get off? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't uh, start, you know, uh, you know, lording it over people, right? There but for the grace of God go I. Mm -hmm. So I can't be lording oh, my, my church going, you know, over on people. But Kierkegaard has a point, you know, anybody who thinks they are beyond hypocrisy better take a look at themselves for the very, just the very idea that I'm beyond all hypocrisy mm -hmm. is so hypocritical that you probably ought to be going to church to overcome right. it. And that's the right. idea. I remember, uh, I think uh, Fulton you know, Sheen uh, yeah. uh, is yeah. said to have had a line where somebody said, asked him about if he went to church yeah. and Fulton Sheen said, uh, well, do you go to church? And he said, no, it's filled with hypocrites. And he said, well, there's always room for one more. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, <laughs> that same idea. Same thing. <laughs> same thing, right? Same idea. But of course the church exactly. is filled with hypocrites. If you define it as people, I think sometimes uh, in, in my own mind, I try and yeah. s stipulate the difference in my mind. Is a hypocrite is like an actor. And an actor is somebody who's saying something who doesn't yeah. believe it. That's hypocritical. The fact that yeah. one might have made mistakes in the yeah. past, struggles to do the right thing, and still falls sometimes doesn't make you a hypocrite. Yeah. Makes you human. That's right. right. That's right. I mean, it makes you human, and and now you're trying to overcome it, and uh, right. and you're not trying to overcome it to seize the moral high right. road on somebody else. You're you're trying to do that so you can be more right. like Christ and serve the person, uh, you know, the people around right. you. And you have a and new book coming out. I wanted you to get you to mention it again. What's the new book coming out? It has a little bit to do with suffering. But it's, go ahead. Uh, it it does. It calls the the light shines on in the darkness, um, contending with suffering through faith. Okay. And uh, the publishers, the great uh, Ignatius Press, wants to change that title slightly to Transforming Suffering Through Faith, okay. which is a fine uh, edit, but uh, these are the ways of publishers. So I think the book is okay. probably going to be called The Light Shines On in the Darkness, Transforming Suffering Through Faith. Very good. We'll look forward to that. Of course, also Mother Angelica's book on suffering and burnouts out. And uh, people can look forward to you at the LA Congress coming up this weekend, and maybe we'll see an interview featuring you in our coming months. It's always great to see you, Father. We'll see you next yeah. week. I'm sure we'll be talking more about, quite honestly, the examine prayer, because I think there's several other steps in there that we really didn't even get to touch on. So I think it's so important and so popular and so powerful that we should stick with that. So uh, we'll look for the Holy Spirit to serve it down the road, but we'll talk more about the examine prayer next week right here in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe, where there may be new planets being discovered at any moment.